pleasure to introduce Andrea Nibus, who will talk about AGT as a technical. <laughs> it's not, the claim is not that AGT is a, is a complete dictionary between those two fields. But the point is that this is a story that is influenced by a, <coughs> an interesting problem in mathematical physics, which has an algebraic, an algebraic geometric side, a representation theoretic side, and you can use it to make expectations, which I, was, I will precisely state and partially do. So, AGT is something that uh, the physicist Altai Gayoto and Hachikawa first proposed, I think, 10 ish years ago. So they did it in the, in the smallest uh, number of cases, which in this case is RS2, but the case of general R was studied by the physicist Willard. So what they stated, <coughs> what they observed, I should say, is a correspondence between two, two, very, two a priori, three, three different physical theories. And I will say what these are. I won't say much about the physics behind it because my goal would be to use them as a springboard for a mathematics, but I'll tell you what their names are to be actually, so that I don't uh, write down the word that's the best. So these two physical theories are on one hand you have a supersymmetric U of R gauge theory, but on a very specific fourfold, on a fourfold which is the affine plane over C, and it is considered in what this is called the omega background. And for mathematicians, that just means that this affine plane is affine plane. So you don't just consider it as, a, as an algebraic variety. You think of it endowed with the invariant action of C star times C star. So for the purpose of this talk, C will just be an algebraic equals field of characteristic zero, which I have to assume. And due to laziness, I'm just going to call that algebraic equals field of C. So this is one theory. The other theory is called total field theory of type uh, of type KR minus 1. And it's a particular vertex operator algebra. It's a particular conformal field theory. So I'm just going to call it a particular CFT. So what these people have conjectured, and in some cases uh, actually computed, is an equality of the, of the partition functions of these two theories. So they observe that the partition functions of these theories are equal, even though they are very different as physical theories. Please match. But for us, we will actually use this to try and guess higher structures that underpin these two, two theories. So, with with that in mind, let's use this, let's use this to set up a mathematical dictionary, uh, dictionary between between on one hand algebraic geometry, so that will correspond to this a super symmetric H theory in the left hand side, and representation theory which will correspond to the conformal field theory in the right hand side. So what is this dictionary? Well, first of all, uh, on top of the correspondence being an equality of partition functions, it actually turns out to be an equality of the spaces of states of these two, of these two theories. On the mathematical side, the space of, of states of this theory is the cohomology group, I'll, I'll tell you what the story is for a second. <coughs> of the moduli space of rank R sheaves, R is the same R as here and the same R as here. So rank R sheaves on the plane. So I will be more precise as to what I mean by the moduli space of rank R sheaves on the plane, but let's assume that there's a moduli space we care about, and that's, that's the moduli space we consider here, and we take its co -bond. 
on the representation theory side, you have the Verma module of a certain algebra. And this algebra is the W algebra of type GR. So the meaning of these two objects in connection with the uh, with the theories over here is that this moduli space is an algebraic geometric incarnation of the moduli space of instantons, which is used to, to define the physical theory over here uh, in the context of equivariant A2. This was to the work of Picasso. GLR or GLR minus one? GLR. Yes, GLR over here. Uh, the difference between GLR and SLR is, is pretty small, but to get an object of the right size, you need to have the algebra of GLR. What means T? Oh, in T, T is a torus? T, T, T is a torus, which is. Torus C star cross C star. Well, okay. is this T star times C star and the further rank R torus, which I will define in a bit. Ah. So it's actually going to be a rank R plus 2 torus, but 2 come from, from these two things and the other R okay. I will define when I define this modulus space motion. By the way, the meaning of this uh, W algebra here is that this is the symmetry algebra of the CFT in the physical language. So that's why it appears. So you do have an equality or an expected equality of the spaces of states, and moreover, you also have equalities of interesting objects in these spaces of states, which, beside partition functions, can give rise to more interesting observables. So for example, over here, in, in, in this cohomology group, you have a distinguished class, which is the unit cohomology class, and you have a distinguished operator, which is the X operator. If I have time at the end of this talk, I will define what the X operator is, but a unit cohomology class is just a unit. So this is over here, and this X operator acts on the cohomology of these moduli spaces. Under this dictionary, they correspond. So before I tell you what they correspond to, I should tell you what the physical meaning of these things are. So this class is responsible for the contribution of what is known as fundamental matter to the supersymmetry gauge theory. And the X operator is, uh, well, it was initially the fact by Carlson and Dr. Go, and this is it, it, it's responsible for the introduction of bifundamental matter to the gauge theory. I should say that a treatment over here is probably on standard for physicists because I really am using the incarnation of the modular space of instant terms, which is not very, very standard for physicists, but it is if you are in the free. It is if you are a great job. This so, is uh, in the sheaves? Modulized space of rank R sheaves on the plane. Are they equipped with the stability or? To be the two, he defines, so I will define it in five minutes. Uh, if you should think of it as stability, what it actually is, it's, it's a framing condition. It's a, it's a framing condition on sheaves which has the, the same the same effect as imposing stability. And if I have time, and I probably won't, at the, at the end of this talk, there are also versions of all of these statements when A2 is replaced by, um, I wouldn't say an arbitrary, but a more general smooth projective surface, in which case we would work with modular space of All right, so these, the, this vector in here, this operator inside here, they should correspond to, to, to a special vector in the Vermont module, which is called the Whitaker vector in pose. I call it in pose because it's an analog of the Whitaker vector in Vermont modules of quantum groups. But you know, this notion doesn't really exist, or it, at least it hasn't really been defined in general in W algebras, but it's, a, it's, it's an analog of that. And the X operator, it corresponds to something which I'll also put in quotes, the intertwiner of W algebras. So I'm putting it in quotes because an actual intertwiner would be an endomorphism of, of, of the Verma which commutes with, with a W algebra action. Such an object does not exist, except for the identity, which is not interesting. While the X operator as an operator here corresponds on this side, it's an endomorphism of the Verma, which is completely which is completely determined by the way it can use with W algebra. So it, you know, for practical purposes, it's as good as an intertwine. So this was the introduction, and now I actually want to make all of this more precise. So the goal of this talk is to properly properly state all of this stuff mathematically and prove it in, in a cuneiform setting. So let me write this down. Properly state this mathematically. 
and prove it all in a cube form C. So what does this cube form C maybe mean? I'll just say a, a couple of words about this. It means that instead of the cohomology of of a moduli space, you replace it with the key theory of the moduli space. I mean, we start with the covariant homology here, so we're going to use a covariant key theory on this side. And on the on the uh, uh, conformal field theory side, you replace a W algebra of type GLR, which I haven't uh, defined yet, with a deformed W algebra of type GLR, which I also haven't defined yet, and I will define this subject at the end of this talk. I won't define this subject. I will, I will explicitly give you a construction of this Q deprivation. Okay, so th this is a plan. I just will start with a definition of this moduli space. So the moduli space okay, is. Can I, I, I mean, what would be the flavor of the theorem? So this is light left side, right hand side, but the theorem would say what kind of thing? Um, there is an, an isomorphism between this object and this object, which is given by constructing the action of a W algebra here in geometric language and proving that what well, the action is well defined and proving that it's on the side of the world. And then you have the, this unit homology class here and you have to, to show that, that it deserves a name of linear vector by showing that it's completely determined by how, by how W acts on it. And the same thing for the X operator. You have and then the morphism over here, which is defined geometrically, and you have to show that it has some commutation relations with the W algebra, and these relations completely determined. So well, can, you, can you describe a little bit of this space? Uh, the statement well, is that trivial, yeah. If you look at the... Uh, oh, the watch uh, space. Yeah, so there is Gruden's uh, Sussman theorem that statement the bundles are trivial. Yeah? Absolutely. So because of that, there is a small yes, yes, pie okay. here, so I'm going to put it in quotes, and right now I make it precise. Yeah, so, okay, yeah, so it's you, will describe, precise you can describe it, just call it loosely. Yeah, yeah, but it's not that yeah. So the algebra acts on the homology of this model? On a homology, and in the setting I'll work with, it's going to act on the key theory. So, so it's like, uh, like a Nakajima type? Of... Exactly, and I'll actually, actually will recall the Nakajima type stuff in a bit. So I'll go, I'll go to that frequently. So, the moduli space M will be the moduli space of following types of objects. Frame, rank R sheaves on P2. So what this means is that you have a sheaf. I guess I should say a torsion free sheaf. Just to be extremely precise. So a torsion free sheaf on P2, well it is what it is. But if P2 is drawn as a triangle over here, you fix a a divisor at infinity, so you fix a line which is called infinity. Conframing on this set means that you don't just consider P sheaves by themselves, you consider them together with a chosen isomorphism between a restriction of F at infinity and a trivial, um, well, a trivial rank R bundle on the divisor at infinity. Okay. So implicitly in the definition over here, you assume this torsion free sheaf to be locally free in the vicinity of infinity. So that gives you a much less space. It has been studied by, I'm pretty sure, a lot of people for, for, for decades, probably. And I confess, I don't completely know the history of this much less space. But what I can say about it is that it's smooth and quasi-projective. So you mean stable means plus zero, um, C1, zero. Well, the C1 is equal to zero is forced upon you by the framing. Yeah, frame, because okay. Because you have this isomorphism. Yeah, okay. The second churn class of such sheaves is allowed to vary over all the non-negative integers. So this can be minus n pt, <coughs> is the classical point for all n in n or zero. So what can we say about this algebraic variety? It's smooth, it's quasi-projective, and very importantly for our purposes, it has an action of a torus. So his torus is the one which appears in all of these constructions. So this is going to be C star times C star times C star to the power R. And the way it acts is these two copies of C star act on sheaves by acting on the plane where these sheaves live. So let me uh, point this out by choosing a coordinate here, calling it Q1 and Q2. 
and denoting these C's by CQ1 and CQ2. To be honest, Q1 and Q2 will not refer to coordinates. They will refer to the equivariant parameters of T in the direction. So Q1 and Q2 will be like the exponentials of coordinates if you want to be precise. But it's pretty clear in this picture that if you have an affine plane or the projected plane with a choice of divisor at infinity, then you actually have the, these Q1 and Q2 and Q2 preserved the divisor at infinity. Now, this uh, rank R torus over here, it doesn't act on the sheaf. What it does act on is it acts on the uh, on the framing, because if you have this isomorphism phi as part of a datum, you can always compose it with an isomorphism of this thing, so with an element of GLR, and essentially I'm fixing a maximal torus inside GLR, and saying that I'm calling it just C star with the fall bar. So this one, it, uh, it acts on the framing. So if you have this kind of action, the main object of this talk, the main uh, the main player, important. So the main object for us will be well, it's an abelian group, and as an abelian group, it will be denoted by k. It is the equivalent algebraic k theory of the moduli space M. So this is uh, algebraic K theory. So it is uh, classes of of T invariant <coughs> vector bundles on M marginal added population imposed by short exact sequences. And if you actually want to be a little bit bit more precise, you will observe that the moduli space over here is disconnected because a second churn class is discrete. It's using by the natural numbers. So you have a, a connected component of M corresponding to each on negative integer, and uh, this will actually give you a decomposition or a, or a grading on this object k as a direct sum of all n is equal to 0 to infinity, kt of mn. So mn would just refer to the, the connected component of c2 is equal minus n times two. So this is the object which we consider should be thought of as a Q deformation of the cohomology group that actually appears in the statement of gradient. Okay, so what can we do with this kind of thing? Uh, I, we have an object in the left-hand side, and now we have to say what this kind of object has to do with representation theory. So as motivation for what I'm about to say, let me start with a usual story of Nakajima and Groshnowski. So I'll, I'll state it as motivation because I, I like to go through it. I think it's a, it's a beautiful piece of language, which is of independent interest, not just in the context of my talk. So uh, I think I'd like to take a few minutes to say what this stuff is. So I'm going to, to remind you the work of Groznowski and independently around at the same time, Nakajima, they just had two different languages of the same construction. Uh, either of them was generalized by Baranowski in higher rank. There are the people who studied this kind of thing actually 20 years ago almost, so the construction is quite classical by now. The idea of the construction here is that you can you can view this abelian group as a representation theory of a Heisenberg algebra. Although I should say they haven't studied a key theory the case, a setting in which they work with is in the setting of cohomology. What they did is to define an action of the Heisenberg algebra. Uh, I'll define it in a second on the equivalent cohomology groups of the modular spaces. So Heisenberg algebra over here is just uh, the algebra generated by by symbols a n, where n goes over the non-negative integers, the non-zero integers, portioned by the relation that a one a two, oh sorry, a n m n is almost always equal to zero, the only interesting commutator which appears is when n is equal to minus m. And in this case, the commutator is just a constant. The constant I'm going to put over here, you can choose it in, in any way you want, but the, con the constant which is relevant for the purposes of the geometry over here is r times n times minus 1 to the r n minus 1 times h bar 1, h bar 2. So, well, 
R n and minus one another that are just some choices of numbers, h bar one and h bar two, they are the equivalent parameters of cohomology in the same way as q1 and q2 are the equivalent parameters of k3. So you can think of h1 and h2 as equivalent parameters of the torus C star and C star. So just the first two factors of the big torus which acts on this modular space. And in this language, for me, q1 and q2 would just be the exponentials of these equivalent parameters. So having, having, having said that, you really should think of the Heisenberg algebra as not just uh, being defined over a field like C, it really is defined over a field of rational functions in H1 and H2. Or there's some parallel fields in H1 and H2 because I don't want to have to worry about saying or localization every time. So this is the actual definition of the Heisenberg algebra which appears. All right, and it acts on this modular space. And the way they define this construction, and I will present it in the language of Takajima, is the following. So to give an action of this algebra over here, you have a presentation by generators and relations. You have to say how the generators act, and you have to check the relations, so let's do it. Here's the moduli space M. Here's another copy of the moduli space. Let's call it M prime. I mean, I'll just call it M. This copy of the moduli space Comprises name sheaves, which I will just call F, even though over here this object should really be careful the choice of framing. This moduli space in parallel comprises sheaves called F prime, is the same moduli space. The only reason I'm writing it like this is because I want to define a certain sub variety in the product of this moduli space. For this moduli space, the sub variety is called C, I don't know how to make a fractal C. So I'm just going to make a, a holographic C. So this is Cn, and it's the moduli space <coughs> of the pairs of sheaves, f and f prime, with the condition that f contains f prime, and the quotient f mod f prime as length n. So it's a, it's a, it's a length n sheaf on, on the plane, and it's supported at a single point at one point. So this is actually extremely important. A fact that a support is at one point. So you consider here the, um, the sub-scheme in the product of M and F prime consisting of, of pairs of sheaves which are inside each other, such that the quotient satisfies all of these properties. So the length has to be N, the same number as the index here, and the support has to be at a single point. That's very important. Uh, you have two forgetful maps from here to here, obviously, this one only remembers f and this one only remembers f prime. So the notation is rich so at this well, here what they do. So let's call these maps p plus and p minus. I actually think in my notation this is p minus and this is p plus. Uh, the construction then of the, of the action is they say uh, let a n and a minus n just be given by doing the full push along this along this diagram over here. So a n is going to be uh, p plus lower star p minus upper star, and a minus n is p minus lower star p plus upper star. With this definition, these give an action of the Heisenberg algebra, as defined over here, on the equivalent cohomology groups of n. Questions about this? This is pretty classical stuff, and I'm pretty sure I haven't done a, a great job explaining it, but I think I think it's beautiful and it deserves a much better explanation. Well, so this whole thing actually works not just in cohomology, it works in child groups. The idea being that what they are doing really is they, they are defining the operators over here by some explicit cycles in the product of these moduli spaces. And the relations are just some explicit intersections of cycles, so essentially the proof of the fact that this gives you a Heisenberg algebra action is a bunch of intersections. It works in, in cohomology, it works in Chow. The problem is it doesn't work in key theory for a very uh, for a very fundamental reason, and here it is. Their construction does not work in key theory 
because the, the space Cn is badly singular, the maps P minus and P plus are very far from being LCI, and because of that, you don't know how to define the pullback maps in KQ. And even if you, if you chose some workaround to define them, it's not clear at all how to compute them. So let me just write this down. Their construction doesn't work, work in K theory, K theory, because the full bad map don't exist because P minus and P plus are badly behaved. P plus minus are badly behaved. <coughs> So, to solve this issue, can we propose a workaround? So this is going to be stated as a big theorem. So uh, before I state this theorem, I have to tell you, I have to draw a diagram for you. So consider the following diagram. So the diagram is going to be here. And it's going to be pretty uh, big-ish. So you put the, uh, the space P1, which is over there, you put it here, you put it here, you put it here. So there's a number of copies of C1. There's a copy of the moduli space M here and a copy of the moduli space M here. The map over here is going to be P plus as defined over there. The map over here is going to be P minus as defined over here. I want an operator which will take me from the, the k theory of this thing to the k theory of this thing. And I want to put some spaces in the middle which will, which will make this work because I can't just use Cn because, I, as I said, Cn is badly behaved. However, E1 is nice. So C1 is actually smooth. It's the only one of these keys which is smooth. And to get an operator from here to here, I'm going to use an auxiliary space which I'm going to call Z2. So Z2 is up here, and what this definition is, C2 is also smooth, and instead of being the moduli space of pairs of sheaves, it's going to be the moduli space of triples of sheaves. F contains F prime, contains F double prime. The quotients are, are all of length 1, and supported at the same point. So it's how F quotient F prime is isomorphic to a skyscraper sheaf at a point X, and it's isomorphic to f prime, quotient f double prime, for some x on the plane, for an arbitrary x on the plane. So if you have this moduli space, obviously, there will be forgetful maps from this guy to c1. So you can get from here to c1 in two ways. Let me call these maps pi plus and pi minus. The idea being that E2 is the moduli space of triples, and C1 is the moduli space of pairs, so you can forget either the, the first one or the last one. So that equal sign looks a lot like the double prime. So C1 over here with the P plus is the moduli space of pairs, F prime contains a double prime. This guy over here is the moduli space of pairs, F contains a double prime. So we have a definition of the moduli space, and we have a lot of, of arrows in between them pi pluses and pi minuses. And now, <coughs> finally, we have a diagram where pullbacks and push forward maps exist in, uh, in a credit K theory as well as in cohomology. So the part of a theorem I'm going to state over here is consider the operators En, which is exactly what you would imagine from this diagram. So P push forward, pi push forward, pi pullback, I push forward, I pull back, dot, 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 I push forward, I pull back, P, no, sorry, P plus push forward, P minus pull back, P minus push forward, pull back. Sorry, I'm hissing up my words, but essentially there's only one way of getting from here to here if you want the right word map to be minuses and the left word map to be plus. The number n is uh, the number of C1s which appear in this time number of spaces C1 in the diagram. So these are ENs, and uh, I also have to define for the E minus N. Put the diagram in a box, because we're going to see it again. E minus N is an object of the same nature, but there's a twist. So instead of just saying P minus push forward the I minus push forward, pi plus, pull back, 
Hello? You have to do something else over here to make this work, so I'll tell you what you have to do. You have to just stick inside here multiplication by certain time bundles, otherwise the construction just will not, will not work. So I'll tell you what these time bundles are in a second, but the statement is that these operators satisfy the Heisenberg algebraic relations and give you an action of the Heisenberg algebra on a key theory you call the piece modulus algebra action on KT of the modulus. So I owe you a couple of things here. So first of all, I owe you what this time bundle is. I'll write it over here. So L1 is going to be the line bundle on C1. So if C1 is uh, the modular space whose objects, whose points are uh, copies of two sheaves which sit inside each other such that the quotient is length 1, the, uh, the, the fiber of the line bundle on top of this is just going to be uh, gamma of this quotient. Now we have a line bundle. Essentially, what this operator is saying is to get, well, to get from here to here, you do pull back, pull back, push forward, and so on until you get here. To get the other way, you have to do pull back. But every time you hit a C1, you also have to tensor with the power of this line bundle, and it's exactly the minus R, R power. The other thing I have to tell you is a little bit more fundamental: is why <coughs> have I changed the location from A's to E's? Well, what, what is R? What is the R here, the integer R is a rank of all of these sheaves. Oh. So, so M is always M sub rank R. So the rank will not change throughout this whole time. Which is, uh, is probably the reason why we're really kind, of, kind of sloppy and varying it in the notation. Alright, so what are the E's in relation to the A's? Well, they are the following thing. If you define the operators A in terms of the operators E by the following formula, exponential sum A n divided by n x to the n is equal to um, summation of E n's, and I really should have called it an H that I'm, I'm, uh, I'm regretting the fact that I called them E n. So if you define these operators as more or less the logarithms of the operators, yeah, the right the ends are the ones over here. Ah, okay, okay. This long, yeah. This long composition. Uh, I should say plus minus. So plus minus. Then the is, A's. Is X in the denominator? Really? So oh, yeah, sorry. The X has changed. X should not have changed. So the point is if you define the operators A as being the logarithms of the operators E in this more slightly. Uh, well, symmetric functions kind of way, so you should think of these as being like power sum functions in combinatorics, and these are elementary or complete symmetric functions. Then they satisfy the correlation a n a m is equal to delta n plus m zero, but instead of the constant that you have over here, you're going to need to have a cuneiform version of this constant, and the cuneiform version of this constant is the following: ah, oh, this thing, this thing divided by n times 1 minus q to the nr divided by 1 minus q to the n, where q in this whole talk would be q1, q2, and recall that q1, q2 are the equivalent weights of the c star times c star. So this is what the, uh, this I would say is what the key theoretic version of the construction of Nakajima and Gruznowski says. Uh, what's morally going on here is the following thing. Their correspondence is badly singular and cannot really be used uh, to define operators in K-theory. The diagram I'm taking here is if you take the derived Cartesian product of all of these spaces in the language of derived algebraic geometry, the corresponding DG scheme, if you will, because it's going to be a DG scheme, will behave like a resolution of singularities of CN. That's, that's morally what's going on. And being a resolution of singularities, it gives you the same operator in cohomology or in Chow, because on the piece of, of greatest dimension, well, you, you're not, not resolving anything. 
But in key theory, using a resolution of singularities of that uh, correspondence would give, would give rise to fundamentally different operators, and can these turn out to be the correct ones, because these are the ones that satisfy the highest interpretation. OK, so at least his cutoff explains how representation theory appears in all of this stuff. So we get a Heisenberg algebra action on the space we want, but what we really want is a W algebra action, which is a more complicated piece. So, well, let me take a break now and say how to go from the Heist action to the W algebra action. And actually, the, the W algebra which appears here will be a deformed W algebra action. I'm going to denote it like this, and it means the Q deformed WGLR algebra. Uh, I should say that going from here to here is not an easy thing because what Heist is, Heist, Heist really is the R is equal to one version of this whole thing. So if you're satisfied with studying Hilbert schemes as opposed from moduli spaces of rank archives, then you understand everything by, then you understand the whole representation theory by the Heist of Perkachian fraction. But in higher rank, you really need to understand this kind of thing. So we have to, to build our way up from W1 to W1. And this is what I want to do in the remainder of this talk. Well, it actually turns out that there is a bigger algebra which actually maps <coughs> on the cohomology and K-theory groups of these moduli spaces. Because the moduli space over here, among other things, turns out to be a particular example of a quiver variety. So I'm just gonna, uh, I'm not going to say what a quiver variety is, I'm going to say that M is a particular quiver variety. And specifically, it corresponds to the following to the following quiver with one vertex and a single loop. Explicitly, you would take the Akajima quiver variety associated to the Hamiltonian reduction of the doubling of this quiver, and that would be the moduli space M equation over here. But philosophically, because it's a particular kind of quiver variety, we know that. Uh, the cohomology groups of M, sorry, M goes here, or, or the key theory groups of M are acted on by some big algebras called Yangians. <coughs> well, Yangians in this case, and quantum affinizations in this case. So the science over here, there's actually quite a lot of it. These kind of statements were studied among other people by Paraniolo Castro 20 years or so ago. Also, Nakajima in a more uh, in a more general context of quiver varieties. And more recently, Haimaule Kadakukov, who gave an alternative construction of what this Yangian is from a geometric um, object which they call a stable basis. So these are just some names of people who have worked on understanding the Yangians or quantum organizations which act on the varieties. And I'm sure there are a lot more people. It's there's been a lot of work in this field in the last 10 or 20 years. But the, the particular <coughs> results which I care about in this case is the following uh, theorem. Let's call it theorem one because we will invoke it a bit. It's a theorem that was proved by Fagin Sabaliuk and independently in slightly different language by Schiffman and Vassro. <coughs> and a theorem says that if you want something which acts on the K-theory groups in question, so on this KT of M which I want you to understand, the natural representation theoretic object which acts here is an algebra which I'm gonna call UQ1 Q2 GL1 hat hat. So I, I won't give you a definition of this algebra, I'll give you a description in a bit, but roughly what this algebra is, is a deformation of double loops into GL1, which is a one dimension space. So it's a double affinization of a trivial thing, but it's an interesting thing. So the single affinization, GL1 with one hat is the Heisenberg algebra, this thing should be thought of as the, the affinization of the Heisenberg algebra. Even though that's not really well, very precise because GL1 is not the cosmic algebra. And there is a general 
a general, a general representation theoretic treatment of optimizations. And this is his object. It's kind of like an outlier, but it certainly fits into, into the philosophical frame. Uh, so we have this kind of action. And now theorem 2 is going to give us a presentation of this algebra. Theorem 2 is obtained by combining results of Burban Schiffman with a result of Schiffman. So I don't think this result was ever explicitly, maybe it has been explicitly written as such in the work of Schiffman, but um, the theorem is saying that uq1, q2 of gl1 hat hat is the, uh, the algebra over a field. Let me take the field over here. Well, the ring, I guess. I don't want to work in localization, but that would give me a lot more words. So it is the algebra of this ring generated by symbols called <coughs> P and K. And over here, the indices, n, k, they go over all integers except for 0, 0. So at least in the, in the size of this algebra, whereas the Heisenberg algebra, um, it only had one infinity word for generators, this one has two infinity words for generators. I hope this talk is not recorded, but it is. It has one optimization collection more than the Heisenberg collection. So uh, I haven't given a statement yet. So this algebra is generated by these symbols, and I have to tell you a module of what relations, and I'll do it now. Actually, I won't give you a full set of relations. I'll just give you the ones which are easy. So here's a relation. It's actually quite, quite uh, combinatorial. So the relation says that the commutator of EMK <coughs> with EM prime K prime is equal to, well, the constant multiple, which for normalization purposes I'm going to take to be this constant, times EN plus N prime K plus K prime. But this hasn't happened for all Ns and Ks with the algebra with would be kind of uh, kind of easy if it were. So this only happens if n k prime minus n prime k is as small as it can be, being the world without being zero. Uh, this is not the full set of half relations in, in the algebra. There is a plus or plus 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 an additional or plus addition node <coughs> relations that had 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 similar but are a bit more complicated. Uh, when the when n k prime minus n prime k instead of being one is either the G C the G C D of n k or G C D of n prime k prime or G C D of n plus n prime k plus. So you can imagine if I I. If I would have written down the full set of relations, we would easily have gone over time. So I'm just going to give it to that. They look like the relations over here. Well, it's a fact, and this is what I want to say, that the subalgebra of this uq1, q2, gl1 hat hat, which is generated by the en zeros, is just the Heisenberg that we have been discussing up to now. is the high speed. Where's R in the left side? So and there's no R. That's, ex that's an extremely interesting uh, <coughs> feature of these things. So one and the same algebra acts on the key theory of these moduli spaces for all R independently. If you have to think of it differently, as R increases, you get bigger and bigger representations of this, of the same algebra. And he, 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 his representations are roughly of the size of a Fox space to the tensor power R. But they are all representations of one and the same algebra. All right, so we have two, two theorems over here. Um, the thing I can say about these is how these, how these E and Ks act on a K theory a key theory groups explicitly. And this is actually going to be useful. It uses the same diagram as over here. So 
my two cents worth on, uh, on this kind of development is to say that the uh, under the action the action in here one the generators E and K act on the K-theory groups by these kind of explicit correspondences that we have over here on the board on the left. So I'm going to write this as E plus minus NK act on the K-theory groups of the modular space by the following operators. So I will assume them to be positive for computation purposes. I'm going to write down the formula for E and K and the formula for E minus NK. If you believe, has written over here in green that the case when k is equal to zero, I've got the Heisenberg generator. And if I told you that the Heisenberg generators have to act by this kind of correspondence, it should be no surprise that the general E and K's will also fit into this diagram. So in the notation of the diagram in the green box, E and K's will act by the same kind of uh, kind of operator, but I will just have to put some uh, slightly different line bundles. I'll tell you in a second what these are. <coughs> so P plus P four T minus pull back, T minus pull back. And over here I'm going to put the same line bundle but to some other powers. So I'm gonna put K1, K2, and over here I'm going to put K and minus one. No K and two here. Uh, where the numbers KI they will depend on, on n and k, and they are these numbers. Minus one. And e minus n k, just like in this kind of picture, they will be given by uh, uh, replacing all the pluses with minus signs and can subtracting ours from these exponents, also changing their order. So there's a little bit of a difference you have to to account for, but it's basically on this. Okay, minus one, minus r, and so on. So what is the upshot of this whole thing? So I have a, well, I, I essentially have a description of these generators of the algebra as some explicit correspondences. That's cute, but what does it actually give us? Uh, what it gives us is it allows us to generalize theorems 1 and 2 from a setting of moduli spaces of sheaves on the plane to moduli spaces of sheaves on the general smooth projective surface. I'm not saying the statement holds for a general smooth projective surface. What does hold is under some mild hypotheses on a surface, those hypotheses are exactly the ones which guarantee that the moduli space of stable sheaves on the surface is smooth and representable. Under those hypotheses, these operators, which make perfect sense for an arbitrary surface, give you an action of this algebra on your key theory groups. So I will make a precise statement at the end of this talk if I have, uh, if I have time, but I'll just briefly rewrite what I said here. The, uh, the formulas above allow you to generalize the theorems 1 and 2 to, uh, to the case when a plane is replaced by a general surface. Original proof of theorem one over here was hyperbolic localization, so there's no hope of generalizing that proof in our case. Theorem one to the case when the plane is replaced by a more general smooth projective surface. All right. So I've talked and talked about this uh, this quantum optimization called GL one hat hat. But in the beginning of this talk, I had, I had, I had, I had promised you a W algebra, and now it's time to, to give you said W algebra. It's not a good. Uh, I'll write it here. I'm not going to need the Heisenberg anymore. So to get a W algebra, this whole thing. First of all, I should give you a definition of. So here it is. The definition I will give you is due to a Wata Kubo Kodaki and Shiraishi, 
there is an equivalent ocean by uh, Dave, Henry Kinn, and Frankel. But what they did is to actually give a generators and relations presentation of a W algebra, and it is the one that we use. <coughs> so because of that, I will attribute it to them. But it's equivalent to what was defined, I, I think, in uh, Richard Tikin and Frankel. Uh, the definition is the following. So the QW algebra of type GLR, so the actual other value algebra is a vertex operator algebra. In the QD form case, you only have an associative algebra. So, well, QD forming a theory of vertex operator algebra is some progress has been done, but we don't yet have a, a complete picture. But this thing as an associative algebra can be defined as follows. So it's an algebra over the same uh, a same pace ring, I guess C of Q1 plus minus 1, Q2 plus minus 1. And instead of being generated by, by symbols E, it's generated by symbols called W and K. But the N and the K now, the N goes over all the integers, the K only goes over the numbers from 1 to R. So now we have to say what the defined implications are. To write down these relations, it makes sense to put these w's into generating fields. So whenever I would write wk of x, what this thing actually means is the sum of all w n k's divided by x to the power n, and it goes over all, over all integers n. So, it, it's, so it's a formal expression which encodes all the w n k's for given k. So with this notation, the defining relations in this algebra are of the following form. So, because we don't have so much time, I'll only give them to you for W1X, W1Y. And here you're going to have to put a rational function, which if I recall is this rational function. Let me write it fast. Actually, let's write it on, on a different board because this is going to be big. This is going to be big for you. So, the defining relations are, uh, are inspired by the OPEs of fields in the theory of vertex operator algebras. So we actually have explicitly the following formula, zeta xy, so zeta of z is the following rational function, zq1 zq2 divided by 1 minus z, 1 minus zq. Q is still the a product of q1 and q2. So his expression minus the opposite expression is equal to a constant which is 1 minus q1, 1 minus q2, divided by 1 minus q, and here you put omega 2 of y delta function y over xq minus omega 2 of x delta function x over y. So I have a couple of things to explain over here. The things that I have to explain are the following. So first of all, uh, these things are formal series with all possible powers of x. So to define the product of these series, and especially the product of these series with a rational function, I have to say exactly what I mean. What I mean is that the expression over here should be expanded in, oh, this is the worst possible color for this time. So this is expanded in y less than or equal to x. So it's expanded in, <coughs> in non-negative powers of y over x. And this thing has to be expanded in non-negative powers of x over y. So because of that, at least this part and, and this part makes sense as a, as a formal series by these, uh, I, 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 these conditions. And these conditions are naturally what to find in vertex operator algebras when you define a normally ordered product of fields. Now this kind of expression where you take one thing and you expand it in one way minus another thing, you expand it in the other way, is a deformation of the OPE in vertex operator algebras. The expression in the right hand side, well it's just a linear combination of W2s, this delta function is just what you know, just the formal expression over here sum of e to the power of f. Now, obviously, these are not the full set of relations in a W algebra, so we also have a more complicated part of similar flavor. These are more complicated relations for 
the combinator <laughs> of any wk of x with any wn of y. It's just that this rational function would be replaced by a more complicated one, so it would take a long time to actually try to find this. So you have two algebras here of different nature. Over here, you actually have a, a quantum algebra with explicit generators and a, an explicit combinatorial relation. Over here, you have something like a deformed vertex operator algebra with some deformed fields and some, ex some extremely complicated computations and relations which require you to know how to expand these fields in, op in opposing powers of x over 1. So here's what the relation is. Andre, can I ask you, can you remind me, where did you use the smoothness of the surface? Uh, the smoothness of the uh, surface is used in the smoothness of a moduli space. For one thing, you actually want a nice moduli space. And the smoothness of a surface is used in to establish the well-behavedness of these correspondences I've used. So the operators I'm defining, if you recall, I had a zigzag here of correspondences yeah. called C1 and Z2. If the moduli space is smooth and the surface is smooth, those moduli spaces are smooth, so, so I can define all the pullback and push forward, all, all the push forward maps. Right. If the surface isn't smooth anymore, then all, all bits are off, and I don't know how to define it, pretty much anything. All right, so a little bit more algebra here. The following is a relation between the quantum affinization GL1 hat hat and this Hubble algebra. So the theorem says the following thing. It says, uh, consider the following elements of the quantum affinization. So these elements will be denoted W and K with a tilde. These live inside UQ1, Q2, G of one hat hat, but I'm, I'm going to put an arrow here, and I'm going to put a hat here. So the arrow means that instead of, of the whole thing, you only consider the subalgebra generated by EKDs, EKNs, living in the upper half plane. So these explicitly are the E and Ks with K positive. Which can kind of makes sense because in the, in the indexing of W algebra, K is always a positive number. The hat means that you have to take a certain topological completion, and you will see explicitly what completion I have, I have to take in the next formula. But this is what the object over here is. So to give you an object here, I have to express this thing in terms of the E and Ks, the generators of the algebra. This is what the formula is. It's going to be a sum over all collections of non-negative integers satisfying this property, the ni's are integers, the ki's are naturals, and the sum of the ni's is n, the sum of the ki's is k. You put here the product of the e's ordered in in ascending order of the slope. So you put the this thing, and p k t, and you also have to multiply by a certain power of two which in the interest of time, I'm not going to, I'm not going to recall now. So this is a high definition. The theorem is saying that, um, that the assignment, which ends the WNK with a, a tilde to WNK if K is less than or equal to R, and which sends WNK tilde to zero if k is bigger than r, than r gives an epimorphism <coughs> from the quantum, the quantum affinization to the W algebra that we have been that we have been looking for all this time. If one had that, to the deformed W algebra which we we defined over here. So what the statement is saying in words is that uh, this sum over here is infinite because it really goes over all collections over here, and this is an infinite sum. It only makes sense in, in an appropriate completion of this quantum affinization. But in this completion, instead of saying that the affinization is generated by the EMKs, you can use his formula to show that it's generated by, by a WNKs tilde. And I'm saying those generators WNK tilde satisfy the same relations as the ones 
um, suggested by Hayawata, Kubo, Adachi, and Shiraishi. And moreover, the assignment over here gives you an epimorphism of algebras whose kernel is precisely generated by, by the WNKs which is going to belong. So finally, I'm just going to give you the uh, punchline. The punchline is that if you want to use your theorem 1 to obtain the action that is prescribed by AGT, so this is going to be the main theorem, uh, Q, P, W, N, K, tilde, which is an element in this completion, G, L, 1, hat, hat, this object acts by zero on the K-theory groups of moduli spaces of sheaves. Hence, the action of theorem 1 implies that there exists an action of the QW algebra on the K-theory group in question. And then you do some more work and you show that as a module for this QW algebra, this thing is, is really in the form of module, which is exactly what you wanted for AG. There are a couple of things you have to check here. So for example, one thing you have to check is that this kind of infinite sum gives you a well-defined operator on K-theory groups. That is a consequence of the fact that the K-theory groups are graded by N and the grading is bounded below. And that is fundamental. If you didn't have this grading by C2 bounded below, you would not get a well-defined action here. So for a general smooth projective surface S, you have to remove you have, you have to replace the moduli space of frame sheets by the moduli space of stable sheets, in which case the boundedness of the gradient below is given to you by the homologous inequality. Otherwise, you would, you would not know that you would not be able to define these operators here. So, the homologous inequality, which is as the bound on the C2 of stable sheets, is exactly what allows me to define this action of the completion here, and it's actually a fundamental part of this. All right. Thank you very much, and I apologize for going over. Uh, may I ask a question? So in principle, if you have A2, that is an action on vector bounds on shifts on A2 by the huge group of automorphism of A2, yeah? Yes. yes. It's an infinite dimension. Sure. But in case, yes, so therefore the whole thing is highly symmetric, yeah? Yes. Though it certainly doesn't keep the restriction at the infinity. Mm -hmm. That's a problem. Yeah. Okay, but is it some has it, first first question has it something to do with the with the symmetries of the whole picture? So the problem is that I'm not really sure how to make that, that into a into an action on these moduli spaces because exactly as you said it doesn't preserve the device. Yes, it doesn't infinity. preserve the And because of that it's not going to preserve this moduli space. Yes. So I would have to, to think about an alternative definition of a moduli space which has to be able yeah. to ask the question yeah. and I don't so know. So it moves through all this Kind of. Yeah, I, I, I have And how does it, you know, it's kind of connected? I, I don't know. It, it, it's a great question, but unfortunately, the moduli spaces, uh, there's a lot of them in that case. There's a very big moduli space in place of this one moduli space that we study here. But I don't know how it's going to behave yet. In case of dimension rank 2 bond, stable bond, yes. there is a bars presentation. Okay. Yes, and our town can, mm, and more than 30 years ago, provide. Uh, created another action of A2 because the first condition is the commutator of two kind of operators, symmetric, has okay. given rank, so you can take polynomial, I think, of one of them, and then on the second, and so on. So in this way, you obtain a, a very big action <coughs> on the, at least on bundles of rank two. Um, on P2. I'm afraid, I don't, all P2. I'm afraid I don't know. Sorry? This construction. Yeah, I can. I, I can. I don't know it, so I can't. Uh, I can't see that was, I, I don't remember exactly the details, but it was so uh, I've come here. This is around age seven, maybe eight, eight, five, something like that. Mm -hmm. So there was this condition x y rank x y is one. Okay. And you can take kind of so ah. you take in polynomials and so on. So it's kind of very different construction, but still a huge action. I think I see, I see what you mean. So I said like our matrices which would correspond to sheaves on P2 by the yeah, yeah, on on P2. But you know, sheaves on P2, you have this huge yeah. action. This looks a lot like a larger Sorry? Oh. This looks a lot like a larger homoser space, right? Which I think was given by a 
How do you know most spaces of quantization of the grand quantization of the small maybe, space, maybe. which is exactly given by this grand Yeah, quantization. maybe, but I, I just don't know what is, if, if it can be. I don't know of any kind of representation theory which applies to this. Yeah, I don't know, but you know, there is a huge action, yes? Yes. 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 So it should be. Yes. There should be some connection after all. Because, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't know how this compares, though. It's just a. Okay. Any other questions? If not, let's type on the thing. Thank you very much. Remember that the next talk is.